Okay, welcome to Rock Docs. This is a podcast about music documentaries. I'm Dave Lizabram. I'm Andy Keats. And uh, today we're going to talk about Running Down a Dream, the Tom Petty documentary directed by Peter Bogdanovich. Direct, uh, came out in 2007. Before we get into that, um, question of the day is this particular movie is like a full career. Like it goes from, you know, when Tom Petty's born to when the movie ends. Yeah. Do you prefer that kind of career spanning rock doc like we did with Tina Turner, some others we've seen, versus one that is more focused on a particular album or a particular era or something like that? The Rolling Thunder Review, for sure. instance. Sure, Rolling Thunder Review. Um, well, the cop-out answer is that it all depends. Uh, yeah, that's bad for podcasts. Uh, my, my, my actual answer, though, if I, if I had to eliminate from the rest of my life all of the films that fall into one category or another. <laughs> okay. And I only You've raised get, the stakes. I only get the library of of the remaining one, the selection. Give me the full bio. Okay. Even though I think that's like the cinematically uninteresting one mm-hmm. because it's it's straightforward. There's not many there's there are fewer creative decisions made. Right. Um but I I there's something nice about the familiar cadence of the 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 seven minute general generalist uh, intro. Yeah. Followed by, so I was born in Plano, Texas. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know, there, it's it's a, it's like a warm blanket. The, right. Just the familiarity of it. Right. Even though you might get to the lame later years or you know <laughs> inevitably just go you get through. to the, like the the director's allowance of the the artist's belief that they've been good <laughs> right. at, in every year of their career yeah and, you know. exactly um okay like when <laughs> the in pearl jam 20 the cameron crow movie yeah that like treats the latter 2000s as as every bit the the creative inspiration that that the first part of the 90s were right <laughs> it's, like, it's like yeah guys i'm glad you're having a, a, a fun time yeah, but I, I do not think the fact that you mix up your set lists is as interesting as say what was going on when ten was released. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess um, in the independence in the ind- it depends category, it kind of yeah. works better in a way for like the Sparks movie from last year, yeah, where yeah, it's great. You movie. know, yeah, where it goes through the whole career, but like most people don't know much about sparks like i didn't even know that much about them yeah and so it's all interesting to an extent and they're also weird so you know that kind of it kind of works versus something that it's more like the movie we're going to talk about today when it's like hey my album highway companion that came out about the same time as this um you know the movie maybe gets a little bit more love than than it should have but um we'll get there okay um all right well then i'll take the other i'll take the other side and say i like the more focused the rolling thunder review you get you really get into the quirks of a particular situation yeah even in the context of Tom Petty, like, you know, there's a Somewhere You Feel Free uh, one that came out last year uh, about the making of the Wildflowers album. And, you know, it, yeah, if I had to choose between Run Down a Dream and that, like, to watch again, I probably would still go with Run Down a Dream. Uh, but, yeah, there, I, I do like getting into the minutia of uh, a particular situation. It, it, it When you do the full, career, you know, full career doc, full life doc, there's always so many unanswered questions yes. and it kind of drives me nuts yeah and you're more likely to get into some very unexpected thing that happened to pass through a time or place that's like yeah like you know in this bob dylan documentary we're gonna spend a little bit of time with patty smith right you know uh which you probably don't expect when you when you pop in the the scorsese joint yeah that, that's doing bob dylan right yeah um and and music is so like that where you know there's like all these career paths that are constantly crisscrossing and it's it's fun to pick any moment that's going to have a few unexpected intersections mm-hmm. uh so so i get it i get it i like those too but okay. but i i think uh, both would be an even less interesting answer than it depends <laughs> it would it would i kind of yeah. feel like music books yeah are better when it's a full life biography and music documentaries are better when it's something narrow 
that's uh, but I can't really I'm not saying I can defend that position but it is a it's take. a good take regardless of of how persuasive it is or, <laughs> okay. or, or, or how, how much you even believe it but okay, well. but it's just like a, a the shape of a take that <laughs> it has one <laughs> okay that was very generous All okay right. um moving on running down a dream uh directed by the late great recently deceased Peter Bogdanovich yes um I don't think we really need to describe the plot of this movie. Some of the movies we really need to like explain who this person is or what happened. But obviously, if you're listening to this, unless you just land on another planet, you probably have some familiar with Tom Petty. And and if you only have some familiarity, settle in. You're about <laughs> yeah. to have all of the familiarity because yeah. <laughs> this is a four hour epic yeah. that covers virtually everything. Yes. Um, Though some some specific things that are left out that are quite interesting we can get into but but generally speaking you get it all yeah so let me just start here if you did not know yeah. that this movie was directed by an acclaimed auteur film director mm-hmm. and you just put it on and you didn't know who peter bogdanovich was or you zip by the name of the director because you were grabbing a beer or whatever yeah. at the end of the movie would you think i need to look up what else this director had done this seems like a a d- movie that has the signature of a director. No, I would not. I, in fact, I did not. I, you've described me. I had watched this movie 15 times mm-hmm. before I knew this was a Bogdanovich movie. Okay. In fact, I didn't even know it was a Bogdanovich movie until I was listening to an interview between uh, Malcolm Gladwell and um, uh, geez, Rick name, Rubin. And Rick Rubin, in which he recommends the Bogdanovich movie. And I was like, well... He must be talking about the four-hour petty epic. <laughs> but I did not realize that Bogdanovich directed it until I looked back. And there's something about that that makes it more interesting retroactively. Yeah. Because then the decision to go four hours and the decision to dwell in immense detail for you know 20 minutes on something that is could easily have been left on the cutting room floor yeah. suddenly becomes an artistic decision. Right. And it... You, you, through the frame of saying, oh, this is an auteur director from, you know, the, the new Hollywood era mm-hmm. is uh, y- you you can reframe all those decisions and go, OK, this, uh, you know, this is a this is a genius talking to me. I, sh- I should I should I should I should analyze. <laughs> yeah. This yeah. Stuff. I guess I should say uh, Bogdanovich. I mean, for people who don't know, you know, he he, he came up essentially as a film critic and got involved in Hollywood, and it ended up making movies starting in the late 60s, and then through the 70s um, was really the peak of his career. The last picture show was, I think, his second feature, but, you know, highly acclaimed, Oscar-nominated classic. Then he did Paper Moon, which was also great, What's Up, Doc? Incredible screwball comedy with Barbra Streisand and Ryan O'Neill. You know, a lot of early success in the 70s, and then kind of career went off the rails a little bit. Not necessarily always creatively, but, you know, artist, or artistically, but um, in terms of financially, things, you know, went sideways. And he continued to direct through his whole career. Mask with Eric Stoltz in the 80s was a big hit. Like, he, you know, he was in the game, but he never really regained that momentum and became like a legend like uh, Marty Scorsese or whatever. You know, one of these people just kept on doing it. Um he did some documentaries. He didn't seem to know much about Tom Petty. I guess it was just like a job. Yeah. Um, and um, when he started this, um, I, I want to recommend uh, for people that have any interest in Bogdanovich, there's um, a great po- – I mean, if you listen to this podcast, please do yourself a favor and listen to You Must Remember This uh, by Karina Longworth. Um, I actually interviewed her once, and she was super nice on top of being a brilliant uh, podcaster and writer. Uh, but she did a whole series about – not specifically Peter Bogdanovich, but about his wife, Polly Platt, and her struggles in the film industry and her struggles with Peter Bogdanovich, who is not always the greatest guy. Um, but yeah, please do yourself a favor and listen to that series. It's great. Yeah. And if you are somebody who wants to put a, f- a face to a name, yeah, you probably know Peter Bogdanovich as Dr. Melfi's therapist in right. Sopranos. Dr. Melfi's terrible, terrible therapist, <laughs> Elliot Kupferberg. <laughs> who seems to exist to be... An example of that it's possible to be a worse therapist than Dr. Melfi yeah. herself. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, that's like kind of like, you know, compared to 
uh, Ralphie Cifaretto, Tony, yeah. seems like a nice guy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Um, okay, enough with Sopranos talk. <laughs> um, all right, let's get into this uh, this movie. Yes. What stands out to you? Well, I'm just glad we're here. This is uh, as important a rock doc to me as that there as there is. Um, I've I have seen this movie <laughs> dozens of times, <laughs> and I'll, I will see it dozens more. This is my comfort food. Uh, what stands out to me, I, I think, more than anything that Bogdanovich does or any decision that the movie makes, is how damn funny Tom Petty is. And I think, I, th- I think the greatest strength of this movie is Tom Petty, the storyteller himself. Tom, Pel- Tom Petty, the uh, cocktail party guest who has a, a really well-told joke about his life for all instances. There's like 25 times through this movie where he is just stand-up comedy funny. Yeah, I would say uh, if you've ever heard the term shit-eating grin (laughs) and you want to know what that means, watch this documentary because Tom Petty has one the entire time. Yes. (laughs) And uh, he's not self-deprecating. No, oh, no, no, no. The you stories know, are not like making him the fool. The no. story always ends with him triumphing, triumphing over some idiot. Yes. Well, okay. So, so I have a, uh, I have a big picture take on this. Which, since we're talking about Petty the, the jokester, and who is not at all self-effacing in this movie, we we might as well get to it now. Um, there are, by my count, seven instances in this movie where basically the same thing happens. And they tell this story without any nods, without any winks. They just trust that the, the, the recurring theme of Petty's behavior in his career as a professional will stand on its own, and no narrator needs to come in to say, here he is doing it again. And that's Tom Petty being a unrepentant asshole. Yes, and no one seeming to really care because they genuine generally accept that he's the genius in the situation. Right. And he is perfectly matter of fact about it. So here, here are all the instances I, I, I jotted down. Um, so he moves to L.A. with his high school band Mud Crutch. Yes. And the first album sells poorly. Mm-hmm. The studio doesn't like, or excuse the label doesn't like the rest of the band, mm-hmm. and he fires them. Yeah, just straight up, they say no problem. They say, "Hey, we want you solo artist. Cool." He says, "All my childhood best friends. Sorry, guys." Okay. Uh, he then, shortly thereafter, is invited to go help Ben Montench, his good friend who was in that band, who has some studio time for a gig or for a session asks him to come help him with the the melody of a, a few different songs he's he's writing. Petty gets there and sees that they're good and he says, quote, "Wow, I got to steal this band. This should be my band." That was my first thought. <laughs> and he does. Yeah. He he steals that band. You've that, heard of and the Heartbreakers? It, that's that's how they become the Heartbreakers. Uh <laughs> All right, that's two. That's two. He uh St- uh Stevie Nicks. mm mm-hmm. Mhm. Tells tells him that uh, she would like him to write a song. She likes the Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers quite a bit. In fact, Stevie Nicks is a huge superstar, singer of Fleetwood Mac at the time, top of the charts. Yes. It, like, also, major flex in that two minutes into this movie, they have Stevie Nicks saying, I would have left Fleetwood Mac to join the Heartbreakers if they had had me. <laughs> right. And that, later Tom says that he told her, well, there's no girls in the Heartbreakers. <laughs> Tom's lack of political correctness is also a running theme through this movie. Yeah. We can get to that. That that like there's no girls in the Heartbreakers. And she says, I know. But if I join, then there would be. And he says, I know. But there's no girls in the Heartbreakers. <laughs> That's like a perfect example of like Tom Petty just being being a little jokester. Uh, so he writes Insider for Stevie. Then he likes it. He takes it. Yeah. He decides not to give it to her. His mm-hmm. quote on that is, she was great. She totally understood. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, then their longtime bassist, Ron Blair, leaves the band. Mm-hmm. Tom is at that point producing a record for Del Shannon, a late 50s rock and roll great. Right. He's saying run away. And, yeah. And uh, he sees that there's a bassist mm-hmm. who also sings high harmonies very well named Howie Epstein. Mm-hmm. And Tom steals Howie from 
his friend whose record he is producing, which is how he ever knew that Howie Epstein existed. Right. And just for the context, like Del Shannon was a 50s star. This was like Tom Petty was producing his big comeback record in the early 80s. And Howie Epstein was the core of Del Shannon's band. Yeah. Like he was the, you know, the meal ticket for 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 Del Shannon to like be able to get this band back on the road and get his career back. No, nope. sorry. Petty says, quote, and he is furious, just furious. He says, he's the guy I count on. He runs my band. How can you do this? You're my friend. I said, Dell. I love you. I'm taking Howie. And he got over it. Sort of. <laughs> Never heard from him again. <laughs> uh, then, a couple years later, he uh, hooks Dave Stewart from the Eurythmics up with uh, his friend and producer Jimmy Iovine, who is at that point producing Stevie Nicks' record. Mm-hmm. Dave Stewart gives Stevie Nicks the beginnings of Don't Come Around Here No More. Mm-hmm. And she's having a tough time writing the lyrics for it. Tom hears it, and he steals that. Yeah. Jimmy Iovine laughs heartily about (laughs) this second theft of a major hit from the artist he's producing. (laughs) From Stevie Nicks again. And yet she still loves him. Yeah. And yeah, both of these people adore him. Yeah. All of these people that that I'm talking about him just screwing over, over and over, love the guy. Yeah. They don't have a bad word to say about him. Except for one person, Stan Lynch. Yeah. Who who they seem to have a, a, a pretty rough relationship for a very long time. Yes. And uh, he kicks Stan out of the band, and yeah, just the original before, drummer, uh, the yeah, the original drummer of the Heartbreakers, all the way up through the Last Dance with Mary Jane was right. like the last song they did with him. Uh, and when things are getting really bad, he is about to do a concert with uh, the Heartbreakers for their friend Johnny Depp at the Viper Room, and Stan Lynch doesn't want to be there, and. <laughs> Petty tells his manager to give him a call and say, don't worry, tell him we'll br- we'll book Ringo to be the drummer. <laughs> <laughs> and he deadpans, Stan was there the next day. <laughs> and very shortly after that, he kicks him out of the band. So there's just like this, like over and over. Wait, let me just stop to say, yeah. Yeah. They, tell to- they tell Johnny Depp that story yeah. on camera, and he laughs. And, and says, he goes, holy shit, it would have been great to see Ringo. <laughs> Yeah, it's great. <laughs> okay. So there's all this, that, like, all of those stories span from, like, 1976 to 1994. The entire heart of Petty's career. Right. There is just over and over, every 10 months, he's just recognizing his own self interest, pursuing it unabashedly, and the people around him sort of just accept that that's what Tom Petty can do in this situation. Right. It's totally mercenary. Yes. So anyway, there's th- that is uh, a, 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 an important takeaway from the film to me. So all those people love him, but what we don't see at all mm-hmm. is almost any treatment of his personal life. Yeah. Or really the lives of anybody, but specifically Petty. I yeah. mean, we find out that when Mud Crutch, his first band, or his original band, leaves Florida. <laughs> that he just got married. He got married to his wife the day before they left. Yeah. They all go to L.A. He goes on to be a big star. You never hear about this wife again. So that was 1974, yeah, something like that. You never hear another word about this wife other than like most incidental, you know, situation. And then, uh, you know, whatever, and then there's 25 years later, there, he's doing a record. He's like, yeah, that was my divorce record. Yeah. You know, and he's also from time to time referred to as a ladies man. Yeah. Uh, quite openly. Yes. Um, and um, they refer to his daughter. His, I mean, his his family home catches on fire right. in an arson yeah he's a, there's an attempted assassination on him right he talks about how his entire family was uprooted that he luckily had these great friends annie lennox buys the family new wardrobe mm-hmm. you hear from his daughter about it right you do not hear about the effect that this had on his wife yeah or anything about the whole or the wife yes later you find out about his second wife who i guess i think was with him at the end so like yeah. you know you see her briefly but right it's really, I mean, it's all about the music, I mean, and his career. It's yeah. not it's about the family at all. If you're looking for that kind of gossip, I mean, really, there's like very little sex drugs. There's mostly rock and roll. Yes, that's this movie. To- totally right. I mean, he talks a little bit about the drug problems that he and the Heartbreakers were having during the making of Southern Accents in the yeah. mid 80s. Uh, but totally unsaid is what was revealed in his biography that came out um, a few years ago that 
he had a, a serious heroin addiction in the mid nineties. Not mentioned. At not all. mentioned in this movie. Well, Ben and Montench obviously becomes important when we right. now okay. about his his death. So Ben Montench, the keyboard player, talks about how he was doing tons of coke and drinking, and that's sort of brought up at one point. And then they get to the point where Tom is recording the Full Moon Fever, his first solo album, the one with Free Fallen and Run Down a Dream, huge hit. And um, and and there's a funny little exchange where Ben Mont, they're interviewing him, you know, when the movie was being made years later. And he's like, yeah, I kind of stopped into the studio to see what Tom was doing, working on his solo album. I think I was clean then. And then you cut to Tom. And he Tom says, goes, <laughs> ben, ben Mont was wild as an Indian. <laughs> Yes, that's Which, exactly another right. example of <laughs> the yeah. lack of political correctness. But um, yeah, so but you never hear about it. Never, it's never brought up again that Ben Mott spent 15 years living in a snow globe. Like it's right. just not, you know, no. it's it's just it just go the movie. There's a lot of loose dangling threads in this movie we could talk about, but that's certainly one of them. Yeah. I mean, another one is the you know we're sort of bouncing all over the place but i think it's it's fine it's a four-hour movie if we went through chronologically we'd be here for six hours yeah uh is the recurring issues with stan lynch um who so stan lynch was an original drummer in the band um before howie epstein joins the band he sang the high harmonies with tom right and you know honestly with if not for this movie i don't know that i ever would have thought to myself that the band had a drummer problem throughout the eighties. Mm-hmm. I, in fact, always think, you know, they're such a fast paced band that, that the drummer was sort of integral in the sound. Yeah. You know? Um, but it's pretty clear in this movie that, it, especially from when Jimmy Iovine comes in to help make the, the third album. And in my opinion, the band's best album, Dan, the torpedoes that that's a hot take. <laughs> yes. Well, I, I think these days, I think there's like, like gathering momentum behind wildflowers being the best album. Well, that's a solo album. True. I'm I mean, the, the, the wildflowers all played on it, but sure. Or, okay. I mean, the, 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 the heartbreakers all, all played, played on yes. it. Okay. Right. All right. Anyway. Um, but that, uh, Iovine comes in and immediately thinks the reason you guys are having so much, spending so much time in the studio is because the drummer isn't good enough and you have to work twice as hard to get the drums to sound right. Well, he specifically says it's not, so much not good enough. Yeah. But he says there's something about Stan Lynch's rhythm on the drums that rubs the wrong way with Tom's rhythms in terms of how he plays and sings. And it and makes it, it makes sound songs, slower. It makes the songs sound slower than they actually are. And I don't... I don't hear that. I don't know that if I listen to, like, I Need to Know. Yeah. Or, you know, American or, Girl. Yeah. That, even The Losers. Yeah, that it sounds slow. To, like, some of the songs are kind of mid-tempo. And, I mean, and in fact, fine. And in fact, they often discuss in the movie that during this late 80s or late 70s early 80s period tom was often lumped in with the new wave sound right for no reason other than he played so fast yeah and and because he wasn't around previous to that so it made sense to put him in with the, his contemporaries right but so yeah i don't i mean i don't pick up on it maybe maybe somebody with a better ear than than i do would would pick up on stan lynch's problems as a drummer um, but I guess what I was going to say is that Tom never comes right out and says, like, I didn't like p- making music with Stan Lynch. Right. And I don't know if it's just him being diplomatic, um, but throughout, like, it's like five albums of of discussion about the problems with playing with Stan Lynch. And never, and, and they're always saying, you know, stuff like the Iovine quote you mentioned, or um, Tom you know, talking about when he makes full moon, moon fever, uh, without Stan Lynch, how easy it was right. and how, how effortlessly the recordings were coming when he started working with Jeff Lynn. Right. And, and Ringo playing drums on that. Album, a lot so. of, yeah, yeah, a lot of Ringo on that. And, and, um, so it's not like a lot is left here at the imagination. I mean, the, the feud with Stan Lynch is a, a major through line through the film, but at the same point, they never come right out and say, Tom Petty didn't like making music with Stan Lynch and eventually fired him, but it took 20 years. Right. You know, but it kind of seems like that's the story. It seems like that's the story and, that no one wants to say. And Stan, to his credit, is interviewed extensively in this movie. It's yes. not like And he, he's a good interview, frankly. Oh, yeah. He's a really good interview. He's got a lot to say. Pretty yeah. much everybody. I mean, of the Heartbreakers. I mean, Ben Mont's a great interview. Mike Campbell's a great interview. 
Ron Blair maybe s- sort of yeah, <laughs> like his role in the band is maybe a little forgettable. <laughs> yeah, doesn't have a whole lot to say. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, all these guys are just you know rock and roll lifers. Yeah, absolutely. And one other thing that the movie does really well um, that I that I think is important in the aspect of this movie is like probably like the most conclusive document that most people are going to get about the history of the Tom of Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers in the history of American rock and roll. Yeah. Is how much Benmont and Mike specifically and the relationship that spanned Tom's entire musical life with those two guys. I think elevates the Heartbreakers above being just the supporting band to a solo star. Right. That this is a genuine band and it it is because of Benmont and Mike. Right. And, and and they really put a, a a fine point on that at the end of the movie, mm-hmm. but it's it's there throughout. Yeah, I mean, Tom, the whole story of them all getting together is, you know, Tom met Benmont and Mike, you know, when he was like seventeen or eighteen. Yeah, and they both just kind of like essentially just walked in the door and were like, "Hey, can I play the guitar? Hey, I play yeah. a little keyboard." And next thing you know, like, they're musical geniuses and. It, the story of the assembly of the first band is kind of like the Avengers all coming together. You know, all these like, you know, superstars from out of nowhere just all of a sudden show up in Gainesville, Florida. Um, I, and frankly, I think that that stretch might be the, the strongest part of the movie. Yeah, that's it's it's just fun times. In, you know, like they're all I mean, they're talking about when they're 18. Right. So all of their memories are, are sort of sepia toned. Right. And they've got they've got real senses of humor. They've. They've told the story so many times that they've they've refined it into a, a you know a, a well crafted joke. Yeah, and uh, you know it, it's like I, I was watching this movie with my dad recently, who does not know or care about rock docs, and he was he was laughing quite hard. Yeah, often throughout the movie about you know how what a good storyteller Tom Petty is. Yeah, you know, and it makes it it's important because there's. In this movie, like, basically, I mean, going back to the very beginning, he falls in love with music, he gets a guitar, yeah. he pl- he finds some friends around the neighborhood when he's, like, 13, and they all plug into the same amplifier, and he's like, it sounded great right away, yeah. it blew him away, they learned three songs and got a gig at the high school dance, and his first ever show was a, such a success that, like, all the other students demanded they play their three songs over again, Yeah. and then, as far as you know, as far as his movie says... He never had a bad gig. No. He never, you know, he had some record. The first couple records didn't sell very well, whatever, but there's not that many downs. No. He was never like out on, you know, it was like, okay, Mud Crush didn't sell that well. We want to sign you as a solo artist. Like that's not that big of a, you know, that's not that big of a dip. No, it's not that big of a dip. You know. Well, and also, I mean, the, the hardest thing that happens is when they're driving to L.A. and their car breaks down. <laughs> yeah. And it takes them two days to get it fixed because, like, they blew a, you know, gasket or something. Like, and, there's just not that much. And and all of that now, probably at the time, but certainly in the telling now, is, man, what a what a time it was. Yeah. You know, we had our whole lives in front of us. We were so stoked. You know? Yeah. And so Tom kind of being the great storyteller and also kind of playing the heel. Yeah. Gives the movie some structure or friction or drama yes. otherwise it's just one win after another <laughs> like yeah. you know it's 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 t- i mean it's all about the adversity with the record label not understanding what he's doing or this person not understanding what he's doing well and so that's the other but he's re- always as he always ends up on top yeah and so that's the recurring um source of tension throughout the movie is tom's repeated battles with the music industry writ large, whether it's, uh, basically taking on his label and therefore all labels, um, by, you know, uh, at least in the telling of this movie, who knows if, you know, his manager says he was the first musician to think to do this. Uh, maybe a fact check would say that, that, that that's not entirely right. true. Um, but that his, First contract was signed under duress because they made uh, his signing the publishing deal a condition of signing the recording contract, and that uh, to get out of it, he had to declare bankruptcy because then all contracts would be null and void, and he stared down the the, the label, and the label eventually realized he wasn't going to fold, and therefore if they had if they had allowed that to go through, 
it may have set a precedent that would allow all of these artists out of their bad contracts. Uh, so again, that's a very tidy narrative and yeah. I don't know if it was quite that clean, but that's the telling of the movie. And then just a few short years later, he's in another feud with the industry about uh, them trying to raise the price of his record, which again, in the tidy telling of this movie was a, a he was so popular at that point that they could raise the price for his record which would then allow them to essentially raise prices of all records. Right. Uh, again, was there was there a ZZ Top record that they were also going to mark up to nine ninety eight at the time? I don't know. Right. You See, know. the story I heard about that is basically that, like, and I was surprised they didn't tell this in the movie, was that um, he was so upset that they were going to... I should also say The Last DJ and his feud with the, right. with the radio industry... 20 years after that is basically the same story. Yeah, the same story repeats. In terms of the albums, the price thing, this is in the early 80s. They were going to raise the prices of albums from like $7.99 to $9.99. And what I heard, what I remember hearing at one point was that as part of his campaign to try to get the record label not to raise the price, he was going to name the album the $7.99 album. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and they didn't say that in this movie but i swear i've heard that i've seen him say that in another interview or something so i was like it's kind of bummed that wasn't in there yeah um because it's such a good part of the story but um <clears throat> yeah it's 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 interesting that there's um you know that that's kind of the structure and i mean even in the very beginning there's not that much about his personal life and then later in the movie like an hour and a half into the movie they like then do a dip back and talk about his experiences with his family, his his abusive relationship with his dad. Yeah, his dad was a bad dude. Yeah, um, abusive. Which, go, which his biography goes into far greater detail than this movie does. Although you know, again, you don't really have to be a uh, literary critic to pick out what they're saying happened to him with right. his father in this movie. But his biography lays out that his was was brutally, brutally, physically abusive towards him. Yeah, and, um, you know, it's sort of glossed over, but you can tell they had a bad relationship. And, 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 you know, Tom talks about how once Tom became successful, his dad just lived off being Tom Petty's dad for the rest of his life, and Tom really resented that. Yeah. Um, at that point in the movie is the only part where you see his brother, Bruce, yeah. who is like a real estate agent or something in Florida, like just a regular guy who has a regular job. And um, he is... Not, not much charisma. Charisma. Not right. super. You can tell who got the charisma in the family. <laughs> yeah. He doesn't seem terribly comfortable on camera, but you can tell that there is a great deal of affection between yes. him and Tom. Without question. Um, I mean, frankly, you can tell there's a great deal of affection between basically every person that came through Tom's life and Tom. Well, at least everybody that's in, in this movie. movie. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, it, it seems as though from what I know that he for his whole life, had a very close relationship with his brother. Yeah. I mean, his brother was not a rock star, went on to just live a normal person, normal suburban guy's life. life in, in Gainesville. And yeah. they both were happy that they were doing their thing and that happy for their brother to be happy doing his thing. Yes. Which totally. is kind of sweet, you know? Yeah, it is. So, uh, house cleaning, a couple things from early in the film. Uh, Tom Ledden, an early uh, member of Mud Crutch, yeah. who was one of the guys who was fired uh, when Mud Crutch dissolved yep. and did not be later become part of uh the heartbreakers you would have thought he was just some guy that crossed paths with tom petty as far as this movie would tell you that's yeah. what he was he's the brother of bernie ledden the <laughs> guitarist from the eagles and the flying burrito brothers <laughs> just, <laughs> so you know there's that there this which is remarkable uh also um you may so there's a, a discussion in about mud crutch that they were playing these, you know, bar gigs basically, and their eighteen-year-old friends mostly couldn't go to the bars that they were playing in, and they wanted to play outdoor gigs like the ones that they saw of the bands they liked, so they just started throwing their own music festivals in Gainesville. In Gainesville, and the the telling in the movie is people were driving from states away to come to these festivals, and then it became this really big deal, and you know. I, I think I probably had the impression with the first couple times I saw this that there was some embellishment going on there. Yeah. That this was probably just some 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 high school kids. Maybe may, maybe they pushed 500 people, right? Right. Which would still be a remarkable thing to do on your own. Yeah. Uh, but I listened to an interview with the Bellamy Brothers, famed for uh, Let Your Love Flow, okay. and the old hippie Triptych. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
uh, they attended those concerts okay. as young kids, and they attest that those festivals were, in fact, famous for many counties and potentially states away, and that they were big deals that were had a big impact on their life. Yeah, now I kind of regret that I didn't look into this more, because I'm kind of curious, like, who else played these festivals? Well, the Bellamy Brothers were just attendees. No, 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 I know, okay, but, but yeah. yeah. I mean, I wonder if, I mean... Like, were the Almond Brothers playing this thing? Like, yeah, what's exactly, going on they here? were around back then. I mean, was Bernie <clears throat> Ledden there? <laughs> yeah, know? exactly. Yeah, I'm, I, I, one thing I am curious about this that wasn't really mentioned in this movie at all is Tom's relationship with music, being a music fan. Yeah. I mean, you see, like... He, you know, they he plays with Bob Dylan, he plays with the Wilburys. We can talk about all those things, but outside of people that he directly produced or played with, yeah, there's very little about other music or you know his involvement, his thoughts about other music, his how he was perceived. I mean, for example, what in the '80s? I don't know if I agree with that, but go ahead. Okay, well, in the '80s, I mean, Tom when he was like at his biggest in the MTV era, mm-hmm. I feel like he was kind of lumped in. This is just kind of my memories with like these like. You know, Americana 80s dude rockers like, you know, Springsteen, Mm -hmm. Bob Seger, Mellencamp, uh, George Thorogood, you know, maybe on the lower end of that. But like maybe even Brian Adams, who's, you know, Canadian. But, you know, in I mean, you could see somebody going to a Tom Petty concert in the next month, going to a Brian Adams concert in 1986, and it wouldn't be in Congress. You know, it was kind of that whole, you know, uh, that whole kind of um, roots rock type popularity scene and that's not addressed at all like where he you hear about him being compared to other new waivers in yeah. you know people lumped under that you know category in 77 78 but basically, other, yeah, after it's basically that, like it's like he was operating in his own universe right yeah i mean they, they certainly discussed that he was sort of lumped in with like the the talking heads and elvis costello more right. or less because they broke around the same time right and they had a sort of uh, sneering attitude that resembled punk, even though Tom Petty would would never be confused with the punk right. punk artist. Um, but 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 it's it's like after that, the the place he holds is almost that he he goes back and becomes associated, even though he's much younger than them, with the generation that preceded him. Right, and that his place becomes he's like the he's he's the freshman in high school who hangs out with all the seniors. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, everybody yeah. thinks is older and you know. Um like I have no reason to believe he ever listened to a record after 1973. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And I mean, you know, it's the 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 musical relationships. Now that said, he 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 does bring the eurythmics re- into um this world of uh the the late sixties rockers sure. that he was pals with and, and, and into Jimmy Iovine's life. Yeah. Um, but you know, I mean, I think like a lot of this isn't, doesn't make it into the movie, but Mike Campbell, when he wasn't playing with the heartbreakers in the eighties was doing a lot of work with Don Henley in his solo career. Yeah. He wrote the boys of summer. He wrote the boys of summer. He wrote the, uh, the end, end of innocence. innocence. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and Stan Lynch also was like helped put together the hell freezes over tour. Yeah, I mean, so they were like pals. Ben Montage played with Dylan and tons of other people. Like all these people are have their other stuff going on. Yeah, totally. And um, and so it, it, it's sort of, and then there's obviously the Fleet, Fleetwood Mac connections. And Mike sure. Campbell just recently went back, took uh, the, took, took the place of Lindsey Buckingham in the in the Fleetwood Mac tour. Yes, on guitar. Yes, so. Lindsey Buckingham requires two people. Yeah, that's right. Neil Finn <laughs> as well. Got, yeah. right? <laughs> it's he's worth two people in a band. Which, you know, I don't know. It's not great. <laughs> Just get him back in the band. Come yeah. on, guys. Uh, yeah, who are we kidding? Um, but so I, I don't know. I, I mean, I think there's, uh, and then there's also in the '90s, he's, you know, he, Eddie Vedder makes frequent appearances in this movie, including performing and singing "Waiting" with them. Yeah. Uh, Dave Grohl does an SNL appearance with them. And See, that's another. I'm just going to pause there. That's an yeah. example. Yeah. So, Dave Grohl. So, what happens is when Stan Lynch leaves the band yeah. or is fired, yeah. um, they were without a drummer for like a minute yeah. and they were booked on Saturday Night Live. Dave Grohl, who, like, Kurt Cobain recently killed himself. Dave, this is before the Foo Fighters had gotten going. So, Dave Grohl was like at loose ends and they bring him in to play drums, famously on the Saturday Night Live appearance. I remember this being a big deal yeah. in like 1995. Yeah. And uh, he crushes it. But. And Dave Grohl's in the in the movie talking about how this was like this 
dream come true for him and it helped get him out of this rut after Nirvana. But you, Tom Petty never says a word about it. He's yeah. not like saying, yeah, I like Nirvana. They were one of these cool new bands. None of that. Or yeah. Pearl Jam. Like he never addresses. I don't know if they'd never asked or just got cut or whatever, but he never addresses any engagement with with other musicians. Well, and the and it's interesting because in this new uh, Wildflowers movie that just came out, yeah. he says basically when that when he's putting that movie, that, that album together, that the grunge era and it's repopularizing rock music and, and centering rock music into popular music again. Yeah. Was something he was noticing very much. Yeah. And that he felt that he could do that both in terms of like the sound and being a, a rocker. Right. And that, that was sort of on his mind when he wrote wildflowers. And that's, and this is why, that's why I kind of attribute this to, Bogdanovich a little bit in the sense of like I feel like Bogdanovich doesn't care about Nirvana or any yeah. music after the early 70s probably right and so he it's not relevant to him to explore that yeah. in a way maybe another younger or more contemporary filmmaker might have yeah okay uh, okay I hear you but I think if you if you take a step back sure. and, and look at the Stevie Nicks elements of this movie yeah the Wilburys elements of this movie the Roger McGuinn section of this movie that we should talk about. Yes. The Dave Grohl section of this movie. Uh, the Johnny Cash section of this movie. Yeah. I think it would be hard to stand up a case that they don't adequately discuss Petty's place in the rest of music. Okay. All right. I Maybe I'm picking nits. Okay. All right. Let's, uh, let's talk about the Traveling Wilburys and <laughs> Bob Dylan. Yeah. First thing I want to know is, did they try to interview Dylan for this? Because he's not in it, and I'm, I would, I, just interview Dylan now and just cut him into this movie because yeah. I want to hear what he's got to say. The Lizard Bram cut. Yeah. At <laughs> least the Lizard Bram cut in which I go interview Bob Dylan and ask him only about Tom Petty. Just like this super harsh edit Imagine where it's like all I, of a sudden just like two minutes of Dylan discussing. This. Imagine me, obsessive Dylan nerd, yeah. finally gets a chance to interview Bob Dylan and I only ask him about Tom Petty. Yeah. <laughs> that would be awesome. No, so so, so, so D- Dylan's Dylan's time discussing this whole section not just the wilburys but also the year and a half that Mm -hmm. the heartbreakers were on tour with dylan yeah is noticeable yeah uh and before we go further i want to ask you what did you think about the lengthy lengthy uh, live performances with the heartbreakers and dylan in this movie Uh, you like them I mean, I think I'm into it. Oh, I loved it. I, those are like some of my favorite, you know, music sections of the movie. Yeah. Was, well, I, I mean, I'm a fan of that. Look, here's what happened. So Bob Dylan's kind of at, you know, at loose ends yeah. in the mid 80s. He's gone through his Christian period. Yeah. He came back after that and sort of was doing uh, some of his, most people consider his weaker albums. Yeah. Uh his live stuff, his live band situation was kind of not really happening. And he, one way or the other hooked up with the heartbreakers and asked them to be his band Mm -hmm. for a little while. And, um, I mean, then they just kept going. They just kept adding more and more dates. Yeah. And like, I've recently listened to some bootlegs from that era, from that tour. And I mean, to me, it sounds great. Oh yeah. I think it's awesome. Um, and then right after that, Dylan does a brief tour with the dead, which he claims that really revitalized him. Mm -hmm. He attributes a lot more of his kind of career revival to that. Um, so I don't know if he doesn't have, which is odd because among dead fans, the Dylan and the dead stuff is mostly not well thought of. Well, the Dylan and the dead album Album is is certainly not not well thought of, but there are, there are bright six concerts together. And if you picked like the six worst perform, whatever number of worst performances from those six concerts and put them on an album, that would be the Dylan and the Dow. So that's, (laughs) that's Bob Dylan being a weirdo. Yeah. Um, okay. So then, then after that, they tour together, then you get the whole traveling Wilburys thing, which is, you know, George Harrison, Jeff Lynn, Roy Orbison, Bob Dylan, Tom Petty. This was a big deal for like twelve-year-old Dave. <laughs> Let me tell you, yeah. and also forty-five-year-old Dave. I'm just gonna say it, say this right here. There is some video in the movie. There's clips in the movie yeah. of 
the Traveling Wilburys hanging out, yeah. writing songs. Writing songs, rehearsing. Rehearsing. Just making fun of each other. I'm just going to put this out. I'm going to manifest this. Yeah. For all the middle-aged white dads <laughs> out there, of which you're listening to two of them right now, please, Peter Jackson, <laughs> get a hold of that this, footage. That is the get back treatment. Listen, that's, that's get the back. George Harrison, get, the second what, installment in the George get, Harrison tri- yes, trilogy. Yes, get back was a big hit. Guess what? A beloved character from Get Back, yeah. George Harrison, also would appear in the Traveling Wilburys movie. If they could say, if they told me there's an eight-hour Traveling Wilburys documentary, then nothing would make me happier in the entire world yeah. so, than to do that. So I was just delighted yesterday. So this is the I, I've seen this movie like fifty times. This is the first time I watched it since Get Back came out. Yeah, and I just could. I was so happy I could have shit. <laughs> when, when George Harrison is talking about the Traveling Wilburys experience, and he said, quote, in my old band. <laughs> it's the best. It is so, right off the bat, just so in my winning. Old band. In my old band, I never really wrote tunes with the other people in the band. <laughs> Who are those people? Is this Mud Crutch? I enjoy writing with Tom because he's not on a trip of any kind. He'll go anyway. <laughs> and My I mean, after watching George Harrison in Get Back, it's like... Just scheming. Yeah, it's like, and how, buddy? I, I know that you just told me the truth, man. <laughs> that is how you felt about your old band. Yes, I've that, seen it. Yeah. I know. <laughs> Oh my God, your old band! My, I love that. Well, yeah, I almost fell off the couch when I saw that again this time. I mean, my old band. Uh, Imagine you were in the Beatles. You're like, yeah, my old band. I didn't really get to do too much. Like, yeah, like, what do you mean? You're like your like high school teenage, band. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the rockabilly the, band you were. In. The other guys didn't let me write too much. You mean Paul McCartney and John Lennon? <laughs> it's incredible. Uh, so the other thing that's like just, uh, and and this is. Would fit in perfectly in your your uh, Peter Jackson version of the the traveling Wilbury sessions, when when they're doing the recording and Roy Orbison is singing, you got it, yeah, and he nails it, mm-hmm. and that little wry smile yeah. comes across his face. Mm-hmm. Honestly, like it was all I could do not to stand up on the couch and just start pumping my fist. Yeah, it is so so awesome. Yeah. I mean, what what a voice, Roy Orbison, the yeah. man. I mean, yeah. And like, you know, you've got George Harrison. George Harrison. Right. He's talking about writing the song and he's like, I mean, I've got Roy Orbison. I'm going to write some stuff for Roy Orbison <laughs> to sing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're talking about Handle Me With Care. Yeah, Handle With Care. Handle With Care, right. There was originally like a, an, a, a, B-side. a track, right? Yeah. B-side. Yeah. And he's like, this is kind of good. And I've got Bob Dylan and Tom Petty. He says, he says something I've like. I've got Roy Orbison. He's like, so then I said, the only thing to do is to do uh, 11 more of these. <laughs> And you got an album. And, got and an that's album. pretty much what the album sounds like. <laughs> yeah, it does. Imagine and you did handle with Carrie, like, what if we just did that again just, for a week? Uh, and whatever happens, happens. And Andy and Dave will be listening to it 25 years later. Yeah, exactly. And, um, you know, it's not all great. <laughs> 35 years later, this, Jesus. They never mention the second Wilburys album. They Trevor don't. Wilburys Volume 3. Yeah. Which, which better first... not mention, in my opinion. <laughs> I listened to it recently. It doesn't really, doesn't really hang together. You know what? I got to say. Fan. It's still George Harrison. It's still Bob Dylan. It's still Tom I know, Petty. I know, but it's t- it's rough. It's rough. I remember listening to my friend Ruben Lieber's cassette tape of that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, shout out, Ruben, if you're listening. And, uh, you know, even at the time, I was like, uh, I'm I just, sure. I, I, if nothing else, I just like the, the clearly Dylan esque humor of naming it Volume Three. Yeah. So for, for if that, if nothing else, 10 years later, someone would be in a record store going, God damn it. I can never find volume two. <laughs> That's true. That's Dylan at its finest. Yeah. Um, all right. The traveling Wilburys. I could go on and on. I, I mean, Probably the greatest I, band like of all to. time. Uh, yeah. I also, the, even the, the origin story of the Wilburys is great. How everyone has basically the same story of how it happened, but like the details are slightly off, which yeah. is exactly how things actually happen in memory works. Uh, yeah, it, it's great. It's fantastic. They're all having a good time. Uh, they are um, having a great time. Shortly after that in the movie, we get into the Roger McGuinn section, which <laughs> yes. is just such an odd section. It is so odd. So Roger McGuinn famously of the birds, which, you know, maybe the band that early Petty and the Heartbreakers sound most like yeah, the closest influence. Clear, yeah, cl- clearly. 
Um, and so McGuinn hadn't had a solo record in like 10 years. It's like 1990 or 1991. Right. It's the album Rio, which I listened to this morning in, in full. Okay. It's, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, imagine Roger McGuinn did an album in 1990. What would it sound like? It exactly. Would sound like that. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's fine. And, um, Petty goes to help him. He he sings. He co-wrote one of the song, the 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 first single from the album. He sings on that song, and he's in the studio while McGuinn's putting it together. And there's some in- industry guys, some young slick industry guys, that are essentially bullying Roger McGuinn into putting a shit song on the album. And this is all on videotape. And it's all on videotape, which I don't know why. And Petty basically just like muscles up and starts telling these guys this song is crap you're dealing with an absolute legend he wrote turn 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 you need to have some respect for who you're working for (laughs) putting a commercial piece of shit like this on his name is not cool go get another song they say well look we can rewrite the lyrics and he says screw that go write another song and he says what do you have like points on this you have you... points on this and... and the guy goes uh the like you know 25 year old record label guy goes ah now nah, that's years ago the people see that <laughs> and he goes yeah that went out in paola right like, give me a break <laughs> yeah, yeah and and so like it's cool it's cool seeing petty totally come to the defense of his friend and and mcguinn is so passive that's the weird part is like why is roger mcguinn getting so bowled over why is like to put his point this is roger mcguinn yeah like these record industry guys he's these saying 20- mr tambourine man yeah these 25 year old guys are not the reason this record is happening yeah. roger mcguinn is but for whatever reason he's incredibly passive and petty at one point says like hey i'm sorry man and mcguinn's like No, you do you, man. You're being great. And then, you know, in a talking head interview years later, he says he, you know, sort of wax poetic about how wonderful it was that Petty came to his defense and that these guys were were muscling him and that he didn't like it. Uh, But it it is odd that McGuinn wasn't capable of just saying, like, I don't like this song. Let's find something else. Well, the weird thing about that is that it's really made a point of, I mean, uh, you know, you could easily tell, you know, people in the future the story of tom petty and go on and on and not mention not this mention. roger this mcguinn scene at all it's not relevant and it's also a thread that's never picked up on no. like you see this scene where tom is just like and i think so okay let me complete this thought you see this scene where uh tom just railing at these record company guys and they're clearly idiots and the song that they're trying to get him to record sucks yeah that's all true. And um, McGuinn, you know, is like, hey, that's great. But then they never finish the thought. Like, you no. never then hear, like, and that album went on to sell a lot yeah. of records or went on to win a Grammy or people, it was critically acclaimed. It's never mentioned again. No. It's just like Tom Petty showed up one day and yelled at a dude. And then that, but I think it's just because they happen to get it on tape and it's good video. And it's good video. It's and good it's good pe- tape. It's Petty being a good friend and it's Petty standing up to the record industry, which I guess is 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 a theme. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's <laughs> relative to like his heroin addiction that comes a few years later that doesn't make it into this movie right? or his, or his know. relationship with his wife, sure. which doesn't make it into this movie. It's probably not one of the most relevant aspects of Tom Petty's existence. No, now, but I it, would not cut it from the movie. No, I, well, it, yeah. Th- and, and so that's sort of to my earlier point about, um, about, viewing the movie through the fact that it was created by Bogdanovich is like that. The inclusion of that part becomes more interesting because it's like Bogdanovich, the filmmaker thought this made Petty a more interesting character made that, you know, that even though it's not in any way essential to the story of Tom Petty's career and, and, and even when you have four hours to work with, so you can, you can leave some fat in there that like this is really fat in, mm-hmm. in, in, in terms of the arc of the movie, that it's like, I, I guess that's the way to say it is if you're going to make a four hour movie, this is the type of license you get to take. Yeah, I get it. And I yeah. think, yeah, I mean, what happens to be recorded on tape is going to be what makes it into a documentary. Right. And, you know, it's a good illustration of that. Yeah. Of and, it, and it works. It's, 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 it's interesting viewing. Um, I, 
so the movie goes on, and you get Wildflowers. You get a little taste of that now. I mean, I'll recommend the Somewhere You Feel Free yeah. documentary about the making of Wildflowers because watching this, I wanted a lot more of that because that was such a great album, and, you know, I was such a fan at that time. Yeah. Um, and then it kind of just goes on. Um, I mean, yeah, Howie Epstein, their replacement bass player, you get a lot about how his struggles with heroin, his eventual passing. That's, you know, a tragedy. And I mean, you know, there's no question that that's dealt with adequately. But um, in terms of the overall story, well, we should kind of we should say, you know, before we get into the latter years, there's there's the whole Jeff Lynn, the full moon fever sure. and into the great wide open. Right. And then and then the Rick Rubin section. Right. 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 right, right. Yeah, I mean, Tom's clearly very tired. He talks about how well, he at one point he and Mike tried to produce an album together and they could not get it together to produce an album. Like, they can't. Right. They were undisciplined. Yeah, and that's and Tom the... Tom seems like a very... Dis- like, his, such a disciplined songwriter. Yeah, you would think he could do it. But no, they need a... Yeah. So they were very and, tied to Jimmy Iovine in the first phase and then Dave Stewart. Well, and Danny Cordell in the early phase. Yeah, Danny Cordell, then Jimmy Iovine, then Dave Stewart. Then, I mean, you could track how yeah. Tom's albums sound by the producers he's working with then Rick Rubin eventually so in, in fact here this is a good time to ask this yeah if you get one section of Tom's career hmm. Iovine Jeff Lynn Rick Rubin which section of Tom's career are you taking hmm. everything else disappears from Spotify <laughs> <laughs> putting a putting a, uh putting an aged stamp on this we're yeah. recording this as artists are move, removing their work from spotify now uh you, everything else disappears from your catalog i mean ooh, that's a tough one that's mm-hmm. a tough one because it well it's 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 interesting because it shows it's a good way to think about just how different because really they always, those are three different eras yeah. of his career right. and uh you know the the sound of you know tom petty is has a a, a a very distinct sound but those are three pretty different musicians i think in some ways yeah um i mean it's hard to say because like i love wildflowers so much mm-hmm. that like i would just choose based on the album it's almost more interesting if i can turn it around mm-hmm. to say like imagine they discover a lost tom petty album that nobody yeah. ever heard of yeah which era would you want it to yeah. have come from yeah I think in a way that's more, you know, yeah, okay. that's that's kind of the way I'm thinking about it. And my answer would be the same in both of these. Okay, so what's your answer? Ivy. The Ivy. So the like damn the torpedoes and you uh, know, uh, you don't have to live like a refugee. Yeah. All the just because of the the sound or because of the songwriting this, in that this era. Both. I I like the production, the songwriting. Hard Promises to me is actually like very close to Damn the Torpedoes to me. Yeah. It's my second favorite album. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think it, that to me is the quintessential Tom Petty sound. Right. See, I agree with you, but I also, I grew up with the Jeff Lynn era. Yeah. And like, I became a fan of Tom Petty in the era of, I mean, I liked, you know, don't come around here no more and stuff like that. It was on MTV. It was cool, but I became a fan more aware of it when I was like an early teenager and full moon fever came out and the mm-hmm. Wilburys and into the great wide open. Yeah. And that's the Jeff Lynn era. Right. So that's it's basically, I would say the Lynn era is those three albums. Yeah. And then when he went to Rick Rubin, there was a whole big thing like in the press about like, okay, forget about that. Like sterile studio sound that Jeff Lynn constructed. We're now mm-hmm. going with this Rick Rubin, like yeah. raw rootsy, you know, thing. And I totally bought into that and mm-hmm. I love, and it's tied into the wildflowers album, which yeah. I love. The albums that he did after that with Rick Rubin mm-hmm. are not as strong. Yeah, although the, that Cash album that the Heartbreakers play yeah, okay. are his backup band is right. Sure, okay, but that to me, I think it was a Johnny Cash album. Sure. Um, so uh, I think I'm dodging the question, but yeah. I guess I, in a weird way, I would like more of that Jeff Lynne era just because it takes me back personally to yeah. when I first really got into Petty. Yeah, I mean, like when Stevie Nicks like goes to Petty and says, like, I want you to write me a song. Yeah. And he writes Insider and she, and, and Tom says, there's like 10 really great Tom Petty stories that or, or just like insights about music when he yeah. says, somebody asks you to write a song, often you try to write what sounds like them. Yeah. But what they, they have a lot of songs that sound like them. Yeah. They want a song that sounds like you. Um, I think what sh- of what she's asking for is give me some of that that fast swampy damn the torpedoes shit yeah 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 no i totally hear that yeah I, and i think that's probably you know 
I mean, go down obviously she wasn't talking about Jeff Lynn because that era hadn't happened yet. No, no. And <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, I think that's going to go obviously down in history yeah. as like the American Girl, you know, that like mm-hmm. probably his most classic rock songs are going to be in those. You know, it's just yeah. I came along to that a little bit later. Yeah. And, and you know, I mean, I think there's a case for Wildflowers being the best album in, in a lot of ways. I mean, it's, it's yeah. maybe it's most complete album, I guess. So the movie kind of traipses through it. It basically doesn't even mention um, the She's the One soundtrack. Uh, mm. No, which, which which is kind of good. Yeah. I like that album. Yeah. And uh, they briefly talk about the, um, the album Echoes in the late 90s. And they talk about Highway Companion. Um, maybe I haven't given that one a fair shake. Kind yeah. of his last real Heartbreakers album. Yeah. Um, and um, the movie, really the last 45 minutes in the movie, there's not a lot happening. R- yeah. However, uh, I kind of feel like the vibe there is like, hey, man, we've been down this road for three hours. If you're still here, yeah, let's just keep hanging out with these people. That's exactly right. And I love it. And you get a lot of Benmont and you get a lot of Mike then yeah. talking about just their tough. lives and their careers and, yeah. and looking back on on everything yeah like they could have trimmed that out but mm-hmm. on the other hand it's great like if you're already there yeah like i didn't want it to end totally and and so you know before we were recording you and i had a, a brief conversation to this effect that like this movie really you know this com- comes out in 2007 that sounds seems like they were both ma- basically making it during the highway like Highway just Companion, before yeah. Highway Companion came out and before that tour, which I saw them on. Did you see them on the Highway Companion tour? I did not. They I saw them like before a and after days. that, yeah. yeah. Allman Brothers open for him. Great show. Um, that the, 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 the Rock Docs era that we're living in now was not on the horizon at that point. Yes. Uh, we discussed maybe too much 30 for 30s influence on documentaries in general. That hadn't happened yet. Yeah. Uh, there were no streamers. There no. was no um, Netflix was they sent you a DVD and they sent you, know. you a DVD. HBO had certainly had plenty of documentaries, but it was like the like homework type documentary. You right. know, the the documentaries that we live with now hadn't been out yet. And this movie in so many ways is like the er version of what we have in in spades today. Right. You know, it the the um and one of those main things is like you can go long yeah you've got all the time in the world yeah. and people will sit you with you for it if people are into it take the time yeah. you, you know people are here because they like the band yeah go ahead spend an extra 40 minutes after they make their last piece of relevant music because they like ben mont and mike <laughs> now yeah and you've got 25 more minutes of interesting footage yeah you know yeah, and um, I mean, you've got Dave Grohl interviewed. Yeah, <laughs> that's definitely a hallmark of the peak rock dog era. Yeah, Jackson Brown makes reappearances towards the end after being an early entrant and then basically gone throughout yeah. the entire time. Yeah, that he would otherwise be, you know, providing some context. Yeah, um, Stevie d- Nicks makes a big reappearance towards the end. Yeah, so I think what you're trying to say is that this is an important text in the history of rock docs not just uh, not this podcast per se but uh, but the but the uh genre i i think you could do worse than start using this as the starting point of the era of rock docs that we're in today you know like a few years later you get the history of the eagles right you know like something like get back do, n- no that's bo- not even on the horizon then d- like much less not even getting made like Peter Jackson isn't even taking that call at this no, time. You no, know? I, I hear what you're saying. I mean, you got a few years after this, you get Long Strange Trip. Yeah. Five hours on the Grateful Dead. Yeah. You get, yeah, the history of the Eagles. I, I, I hear what you're saying. In a way, I almost think like, you know, if... if Beats Rhymes in Life, frankly. Sure. Yeah. If the peak TV era, yeah. it, you know, starts with The Sopranos, really starts with The Sopranos. Right. But, but everybody who talks about it goes, well, like, if you go back a little bit, you get like Oz. Yeah. You get like the precursors. You get NYPD Blue. Quite, yeah. yeah, you weren't quite there yet. West but Wing. Were, yeah, yeah, but they were on the cusp. Yeah, that's what this is. It's sort of on. It's this is the Oz. Yes, of, <laughs> this is the Oz. Yes, yes, exactly. To the history of the Eagles is the Sopranos because it shows <laughs> it shows creative people who have options. Like, yes. oh, that's a cool thing I could do. Yeah, you know, like Peter Bogdanovich. Yeah, did a four hour petty doc. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's um, yeah, because like the and the golden era of TV 
to or the prestige of TV or whatever uh, highfalutin way you want to describe it is is a good example because if you listen to the interviews about mo- all those documentary uh, those shows yeah. in their first seasons it was at that time still slumming it to go to TV right and you were dealing with different actors who, exactly. who weren't eligible for yes. for film yeah and they changed that yeah and documentaries were playing in a different ball game right and they're not now and this is like a, a a transitional movie in that in in that period i think right bogdanovich was a named director who was like down on his luck and, and they were able to get him to do this and petty's a big star no right. question yeah rock and roll hall of famer easy yeah. all that but like it's not obvious that Petty would be the one to get the four-hour doc treatment. Right, because you know? Petty was sort of like a good argument for the career versus peak, yeah. which you get in sports a lot, where yeah. Tom Petty was never... There's probably no year of his career where he was the MVP. Right. You know, maybe you could pick one out and say, well, you know, this was the best album of the year, this was whatever. But, like, in terms of commercial success, like, I don't think he ever had the best-selling album of the year. Right. And, you know, he, he didn't... You know, it just was... He was... There was always somebody... You know, he was all, he was always the, the guy behind, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, when Bruce Springsteen was huge, like Tom Petty was never quite that big. Right. Or whatever. Yeah. Um, you know, he was never the greatest songwriter as Bob Dylan or something. But yeah. Yeah. he, you know, over the 20, 30 years of his career, put together just like, you know, doubles and triples and the occasional home run. Yeah. And then you look back and you're like, yeah, that's a Hall of Famer. Yeah. I have a buddy, uh, Peter, who says that. Uh, it's like a bit he does that like everyone likes Tom Petty. Yeah. It you it may not be your favorite right. musician. Right. It's probably not your favorite musician. It's probably not many people's favorite musician. But it's for everyone. Yeah. Everyone likes Tom Petty. Yeah. You know? It's 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 he's he's the jack, you know? Yeah. He's like Tony Gwynn. Yeah. Right. I mean, you right. know, he pretty much you know he's going to show up and he's going to, you know, hit that single. Right. And uh, you know, he's probably not going to hit the game-winning home run, mm-hmm. but that's not what you need him for. You need that guy. Yeah, that's right. Um, okay, so <clears throat> we've discussed where this movie lands in the firmament yes. of rock docs. We've discussed um, Peter Bogdanovich and and and, and um, Tom Petty's career. One thing we should talk about is like how much it rocks, like yes. the music. Yeah, there's a lot of music in this movie. A lot of music, and it's awesome. Yeah. Uh, because Tom Petty's music is awesome, but yep. like they play a lot of B sides, they mm-hmm. play a lot of songs that that um, you know we have a, a whole rehearsal for songs that you know didn't make it onto an album. Yeah, um, songs like uh, "Having Trouble Letting You Go," which is like the B side on on "Hard Promises," that you know is like the the lesser of the Iovine albums. Yeah, and you get the, Tom and Stan like harmonizing on a John Sebastian cover. Yeah, and like. That footage is awesome. Yeah. You know, it's uh, the, the Mud Crutch songs like Depot Street, that song, that yeah. Mud Crutch song that's like got a real reggae vibe. Mm-hmm. It's kind of a jam. Yeah. Um, so, I, you know, the, 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 the music rocks in this movie. The, like we said, the, the long jams on with Bob Dylan. Yeah. There's a lot. There's a lot of music. Um, just the running time allows for that as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, the thing about the movie that, you know, is tough. I think is the when you know when talking about the ending and they're like this this could go on forever you know I can't wait to listen to the music Tom Petty makes when he's eighty yeah and yeah. and that you know of course they didn't know that ten years later he was going to die at the age of sixty six you know from like OD on fentanyl or whatever it was yeah um and it's you know it it really that's the only thing about the movie that's you know a tough hang is those moments of like regret for what could have been yeah. And, you know, now that Bogdanovich is gone, like, you don't get those two guys. But, you know, I do feel like it's an incomplete story because Mm -hmm. the movie just kind of ends like, hey, I'm still doing this thing forever. You know, it's the road goes on. And now, you know, we know that in the last 10 years after the movie, the last 10 years of his life after the movie ends, he reunited with Mud Crutch, made Mm -hmm. another album with them that was pretty good. Yeah, I saw them live on that tour. It was great. And, um... You know, and then he got back together with the Heartbreakers and, you know... And headlined big festivals. Yeah, you know. and eventually, you know, and then passed away, unfortunately. And that last 10 years, I think, deserves... Um, Some probably, time. I just don't know that we're going to get 
a documentary where somebody comes <laughs> along and makes the appendix <laughs> last 10 years just of like, his career. I but, love that Bogdanovich movie. We just need to finish it. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, the unfinished story. I, you know, I, I, I would love it. I don't know that it's going to happen, but, uh, and I don't know that I want that as much as the eight hour long Peter Jackson <laughs> Traveling Wilburys movie that I'm begging for. Yes. But, but, I, but, but I do feel like it is, unfortunately, it's incomplete because his life ended you know at such an early age but also it's incomplete because the, the it just kind of ends and you know there's a little bit more to the story especially coming back together with mud crutch would really bring it together yeah you know and that was a cool that was a just a cool thing he did yeah i, I mean like i don't know tom petty's just so like there's like 10 people who say this and then we like tom petty's just cool yeah and putting mud crutch back together and playing these tiny venues when you're tom petty and like you know when they Booked those venues. They didn't write like Mud Crutch parentheses Tom Petty. Right. It's it was just mud like crutch. Mud Crutch. Yeah. You know, you had to know what you were looking yeah. at. Yeah. At one point in the movie, he goes, On Thanksgiving Day, I was driving <laughs> down to buy a baseball mitt. <laughs> That's when he sees Jeff Lynn. I love That's what he sees Jeff I Lynn. love that. I have, if, if like my friend said that sentence to me, I would have so many questions. Yeah. Like, um, what was open? Why did you need a baseball mitt? Is that really the right time well, to buy it? <laughs> it's also like the sentence on Thanksgiving Day, I was driving down the road to buy a baseball mitt. Is so Americana. Yeah. Like, were you eating an apple pie and drinking a Coke? Like, what were you doing? Yeah, what were you listening to? Tom Petty? Singing the Star Spangled Banner and listening to Tom Petty. Like, what were you doing? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's so good. It's so good. Um, I don't even know that I, if there's any point to asking this question, but if somebody is not like a huge Tom Petty fan or maybe not a huge Peter Bogdanovich fan, imagine such a thing. Uh, would you recommend this movie to them? An unqualified yes. Yes. Yeah, unqualified yes. I like. I, in fact, I don't even. This isn't even a hypothetical. I played this movie for my dad, who's listened to like six and a half songs in his life, and he loved it. Yeah. So you could play this movie for anyone. Yes. I was uh, watching it again last night, getting ready for it, and my four-year-old uh, cruised into the room, and he. He sat there, like, he usually has no interest in whatever I'm watching, um, but he, he watched a little bit of it, and I was like, that's Tom Petty, and he was like, okay, easy, and then tonight, like, before bed, he came in, uh, and and he goes, uh, hey, can we watch a little bit of that rock doc again? Now, <laughs> that may have just been a ploy to delay bedtime. Yeah, sure. Uh, but I put it on from the beginning, and he watched, like, the first 15, 20 minutes, and he was digging it, you know? Yeah. He, you know, Tom's talking about, uh, you know, how he was so influenced by the Beatles when they went on the Ed Sullivan show. They show a little clip of that. My kid turns to me and he goes, did the Beatles all live in a house together? <laughs> I'm like, well, that's kind of like the vibe they were throwing off when you think about it. Yeah. You know, they're all like buddies dressed the same. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. So, it re, you know, we've got Andy watching this with his dad, me watching it with my son, generations to generation. 80 to four right there. Yeah. You yeah. Know? Everybody loves it. Everybody loves Tom Everyone Petty. likes Tom Petty. Tom Petty's music for everybody. Yeah. I'm, I'm comfortable standing on that take. Yeah. So high, highest possible recommendation. High, uh, this is, this is, I, mean, I have things that I wish were different or, you know, that I would, I would love to see the, the threads closed. Oh, I, I, one last thing, uh, just, just, just to get it in for posterity. Yes. Uh, they, when they talk about the, the record company didn't like full moon, moon fever. Oh my God. Yeah. And Denny Cordell says that he fired off this note saying, fire all your A&R people. This, yeah. This record's incredible. And obviously it becomes the biggest record of his right. career. Free to that, Fallen. To that, right. to that date, Free Fallen. Uh, can't won't back down. And there is a, a story that is not told in this movie that is in his biography that he's out to dinner with George Harrison and some Warner Brothers execs. Yeah. And he tells them about what's going on with his record that, they, that uh, MCA won't put it out. They listen to it and they're like, are you kidding me? And they sign a contract right there. But Petty needs to finish two more records before he can put it out with them. And so they sign a contract that eventually becomes Wildflowers ah. and put it in a drawer huh. for like four years. Wow. But, and just kept it a secret. But he, they committed to him then. We would never treat you like that. And that's how he ends up with Warner Brothers. Interesting. So that's probably why he did the Greatest Hits album. Because when he's recording he, Wildflowers, he agreed begrudgingly to do the Greatest Hits album and because he had a contractual... He says it's a contractual obligation, but it's probably just to complete that original contract. Exactly. 
Interesting. Yeah. Okay, adding some but more flavor. Why would you not, not include that? I don't <laughs> it's a great know. story. I don't know. And Warner Brothers is puts it is the production company on this film. It makes them look like this like artist you know artist first organization. Right? I mean, yeah, but you got to have that Roger McGuinn. <laughs> <laughs> the people are demanding. <laughs> what do you lots think? Lots and lots of content you, about Roger McGuinn. What do you think that asshole in that record studio who's like fifty now mm-hmm. thinks about how he <laughs> thinks about this movie? Oh, no, that guy is definitely telling everybody, like, Full Moon Fever, you know, I won't back down, uh, <laughs> yeah. Free Fall, and that was me. Look yeah, look at the album. Yeah. I'm listed as a, you know, executive producer or something, and yeah, yeah. I knew it was going to be a hit all along. They were saying, you shouldn't go solo, he's so good with the Heartbreakers. <laughs> it was me telling him, you should do this, and yeah. ended up making his career. Yeah. This guy's in my, th- in my, you know, he's telling this on his boat, smoking a big <laughs> cigar. <laughs> Yeah. That guy's probably not hurting. And in his mind, he's the hero of the story. Yeah. And you know what? If they're going to make a rock doc about that guy, I'm watching it. <laughs> Sign me up. I'm in. Rock docs. All right.